Okay. Um, good morning, everybody. Hopefully you can hear me okay. If not, let me know. Weave at me or something. Um, so before we start on this talk, I just want to make a quick comment. Um, so with all the thanks to Hui and all the people associated with it that pull out this meeting each year, let's not forget Heather Benway, who not only helps organize this meeting, but gets a lot of these science reports you just heard about over the finish line. Okay. So a big thanks to Heather for all of her hard work. So I, I just want to make a comment before we start this. We're going to tag team this talk for a couple of reasons, mostly because um, we've been working on this mission a long time. But I want to echo something, something Mark said really resonated with me. And let this sink in, OK? The last time we talked about a new ocean color satellite mission and landing one was in 1984 when we were thinking about JGOPS, OK, and spinning up JGOPS. It is 2016. So, so let that sink in how long it takes to get a billion dollars out of the government to allow us to do this. So let's not pass up this opportunity to talk about what we're planning right now, because um, it will be another 30 years probably before we're you know, sitting here and standing here talking about this again, um, realistically. Okay? So this is a real opportunity to talk about what we think are the next field of observables in the ocean under the heading of ocean color remote sensing. Additionally, um, and I, I absolutely classify myself in this group and mean no disrespect, but I know how busy we all are. I know there's a lot of email to answer. I know there are a lot of things to look at. Today is focused on some advanced planning, not only with this mission, but with some potential future field programs that are not written in stone yet, and that really need ideas and feedback and discussion from the science community. So I'm, I'm prepared to beg you to pay attention today and really listen to the talks throughout the day and make sure that your voice is heard in the planning of some of these field campaigns that may happen in the future, okay? So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Mike because he's literally been thinking about this mission for about 17 I years. Oh, am I first? You're okay. first. <laughs> so I thought you were gonna give an introduction yourself since you spent your whole life thinking about this, okay. Okay, I'll so have what, time to talk. what are we going to talk about today? You know what, I'll go on the other side so yeah, you don't kick me. Okay. <laughs> okay, so um, as Mark pointed out, it's been a really long time since we talked about this. For those of you who are not that familiar with ocean color remote sensing, it's the idea of using properties of the ocean and light leaving the ocean to actually estimate some properties of the ocean on a global scale or from space. Am I doing this the right way or the wrong way? Okay. So our first mission was a proof of concept called the Coastal Zone Color Scanner. It was launched in the 70s and ran through about the mid 80s, 86, I think. Um, basically, it was a, can we do this or not? And does it work, okay? Um, sea whips you heard about from Mark, we, that was from, I was actually standing in Gene, Feld, Gene Feldman's office at NASA Goddard when that launched in 1997 as a summer research intern at NASA Goddard. Um, and that died, I think, 2011. Modus Terra and Aqua are on orbit, and SUMI NPP Veers um, is actually on orbit right now. Um, and these missions were launched with the idea that we might be able to do some advanced ocean color remote sensing, but the idea was to get a time series of high quality core properties of the ocean from space. And if you look at this um, schematic on the bottom from Colleen Mao's paper, you know, you've got time here and length here. You can sort of see the areas where um, our historical missions fall, okay? And you've even got some experimental ones. One's in, Heiko was on the space station, history is one in pre-formulation. Um, you know, where, where is our thinking right now? And then the question becomes, you know, where is the PACE mission gonna fall on this diagram? And that's what we wanna talk about today. Next slide. Let me go on. Okay. Um, okay, so literally on a weekend, like in 2010, I got a phone call from my boss, my big boss, and he said, hey, can you get together with this other guy in the office who runs the radiation sciences program and write us like a one-pager justification for the next ocean color satellite mission because the White House really wants us to do something in climate. And you go, sure, how much time do I have? It's Saturday morning at nine. Oh, this is due by four? Oh, good, okay, good thing you caught me. Um, and we wrote the justification for the PACE mission in a weekend, and Mike Freilich, the Earth Science Division Director, went and sold it, and here we are, okay? Um, sometimes that's just how things happen. That document, 
called The Climate Initiative was published in June of 2010. Um, you can go online and you can find it. But literally, that justification that we wrote was based on the state of the research that you all have done over the last several decades and where we think we needed to go. Okay, so um, what was in that document? Well, this PACE stands for the Plankton Aerosol Cloud Ocean Ecosystem Mission. This is an interdisciplinary mission that has a primary instrument to do advanced ocean color remote sensing, continuity of some ocean color observations that we started with CWIFs and MODIS, and then some additional observations to do some continuity for the aerosol and cloud community. There's also the opportunity to do some advanced aerosol and cloud science. Um, this is from uh, the potential addition of a polarimeter instrument on board, okay? And so we're looking at ocean biology, ocean biogeochemistry, ocean ecology, continuity of aerosol and cloud <coughs> observations from the MODIS time um, frame, and then additionally some advanced observations of aerosol and clouds from a polarimeter. Slide. And the only thing I'd add to that is I highlighted the new part. So it yeah. does call for not only continuity, but new observations, new approaches to looking at ecosystems. And it calls out specifically at the bottom interactions between oceans and aerosols and aerosols and oceans. So there's this interdisciplinary nature to it that was uh, directly spelled out. Okay. So after the um, uh, announcement of the PACE mission, uh, NASA headquarters put together a science definition team. This was in 2012, uh, 2011. And uh, it was a group of scientists that were representing the oceans, the atmospheres, terrestrial as well as freshwater. And their task was to identify the science that would be behind PACE and to make, um, I can't say recommendations, can I? Suggestions about what the threshold requirements would be for this mission, the measurement requirements and the baseline. It's a beautiful 274 page document. I'm sure you all would love to read. Um, <laughs> but the, the basic, laser what's that? Do you have the laser pointer? No, I've got, a, got, I've got a pointer in my pocket. Okay. Just in case, you never know. <laughs> okay. um, and, basic science questions that came out of that are shown here. So for the ocean side of this, what are the standing stocks and compositions of the ocean ecosystems? How and why are they changing? How and why are ocean biogeochemical cycles changing? How do they influence the Earth's system? How do physical processes affect ocean ecosystems? What is the distribution of both harmful and beneficial algal blooms? And how do changes in critical ocean ecosystem services affect human uh, welfare um, and well-being? So there are applied sides to this mission. And then on the uh, atmospheric side, uh, the basic questions are, what are the long-term changes in aerosols and cloud uh, properties, and how are these properties correlated with interannual climate oscillations? And this gets back to the continuity aspect of PACE with MODIS and Beer's measurements. And then what are the magnitude and trends of direct radiative forcing and its anthropogenic component? And when we were meeting as a science team, the assumption was that we were going to have a polarimeter, which is still on, on board, um, possibly, with PACE. And then there was interdisciplinary questions. How do aerosols influence ocean ecosystems and biogeochemical cycles, and how do ocean biological and photochemical processes affect the atmosphere? Talk. Okay, so how did this come to be? Well, um, there are many missions at the agency that sort of buy for an official point, you know, in the planning timeframe of the Earth Science Division. In case you're wondering, from the time that you decide to build a mission with all your ducks in a row to the time of launch on average is about seven years. And when you see timelines shorter than that, that's the engineers moving at an absolutely breakneck pace. And it may seem ridiculous, but it takes a very long time. Um, so in 2014, we actually crossed into official pre-formulation. Um, the agency said, go ahead and start formulating the, the formal ideas for the mission, okay? Um, and so there was a letter of direction in 2014 that said, Pick a project and start moving out on the planning for this. Um, we've got an operational budget of $805 million. The allocation for science is about $100 million of that. You may say, wow, that's a lot of money. It, it is spread over something like a 10 or 12 year time frame. Okay, and there's a lot to accomplish with that science piece, but a large chunk of this is gonna be advertised. It includes things like the science data segment, which was directed to NASA Goddard, the Ocean Biology Processing Group, and then there's a portion about competed science teams, which we're gonna talk about in a minute. Those are the opportunities that are broadly open to the science community. Um, PACE is a huge investment. Ultimately, the project allocation of that 805 is 705. There's a chunk in there for all of these headings. 
you know, you basically, that's the same amount of money you use to buy a, a launch vehicle and a spacecraft as well as pay for things like project science, so. Yeah, I just want to re-emphasize what Paula had mentioned early on in just now. Now, this is probably the largest investment NASA's gonna make into ocean bio biogeochemistry this decade, so it's really something we need to be paying attention to and trying to be involved in. I also wanted to point out that, and Paula mentioned this, but just to be clear that the project resides at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, so that's where the project office is. Um, how many know Jeremy Wardell? You guys know Jeremy? Yeah. Jeremy's the project scientist. Andre Dress is the project manager. Um, if you want to find out more information, that's where you can start looking. Okay, so a couple more characteristics of the mission. Um, it's designed to cost, which means that we have a cap. Right, it's 805 minus the 100. We have to fit in that box. If we don't fit in that box, we're done, okay? And so what, we wanted, what we're trying to do is to, to get the best mission we can within that cost cap. And we're trying to find a way in which we can also have a polarimeter within that cost cap. And that's why in the previous slide mm -hmm. I said the polarimeter was optional. How we get that depends upon how much money we have available and who might be able to contribute an instrument. That's it's a Class C mission, which means its prime life is uh, targeted for three years, but it's carrying 10 years of fuel. So that tells you what we hope it's going to do. Uh, Sun-synchronous sun polar orbit and uh, equa equator crossing time. The window in the do uh, SDT document was 11 to 1 o'clock. It's probably going to be on the 1 o'clock side of that. Okay? So where are we now? Here's kind of the really rough schedule for the mission. Uh, in June this year, we pass through KDPA. Uh, that is the key decision point. This is where we go from pre-mission, pre pre-phase um, A formulation studies to phase A, and that's when we start actually spending the money. So the clock is now ticking um, in terms of, of getting this thing to launch on time. Um, the spacecraft CDR, CDR is critical design review, so you can understand these uh, acronyms. INT is the integration and test. We're looking for a launch sometime on the order right now of about August 2022. All right, this is just a, a CAD drawing of, of the instrument as it's being developed uh, conceptually right now. Um, what you're looking at here is, uh, this is, um, it's a, let's see, start, start down here. Earth is down here, <laughs> spacecraft's up there, okay? This is a, uh, there's a rotating telescope in here, okay? And uh, this is a calibration unit for solar and lunar calibrations. Um, it's a, uh, it's a hyperspectral instrument. It has the visible and near, uh, near UV visible and, and near infrared separated into two um, detector arrays, the blue channel and the red channel. And then up here are the uh, SWIR band detectors. So the, the design of this instrument um, is, is taking a lot of lessons learned from previous sensors that we've, that we've developed, okay? Um, the objective is to deliver on the ocean aerosol and cloud science objectives. This guy here tilts, kind of like SeaWiffs did to avoid sun glint, okay? Um, the, the target is to get uh, two-day global coverage, uh, monthly lunar calibrations where all detectors in the system are illuminated by the moon, which was one of the characteristics of SeaWiffs that allowed it to be easily characterized. Um, rotating scanner design, I mentioned that, that's the telescope. Very high signal to noise requirements. Uh, this is exciting. Um, they're trying to target a full download of five nanometer resolution data from 350 nanometers, the minimum, to about 900 nanometers. So this is a true hyperspectral scanner. Um, there's six SWIR bands for atmospheric. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Atmospheric science. <laughs> That's the word that popped into my head. Um, we're also still looking at potential ways of pushing this instrument even harder. So one of the things we're looking at is potential. This is a one kilometer resolution at Nader. We're looking at possible ways of getting uh, finer spatial resolutions um, toward the edge of scan. Because as the scan goes out, the si size of pixel gets bigger. We're trying to get that smaller. Trying to push the instrument maybe down to 315 nanometers. That would allow us to do ozone measurements simultaneously and, and also get some more of the shorter UV wavelengths. And here's another really cool idea we're thinking about, and that's um, the potential for specific parts of the spectrum to be super sampled spectrally, looking at like one nanometer resolution. We can think about science applications of that capability. 
So just to emphasize the overarching objectives of this instrument, we really want to get super high quality ocean color measurements out of this. And to continue and advance cloud and aerosol uh, climate records started by Modus and Beers. And I put these pictures up here to show you what we don't want, okay? This is not what we want. You can see all the striping, a lot of these instrument artifacts. So we're trying to design an instrument that has very, very low, very small instrument artifacts. A uh, key part of this design is uh, what's called time-delayed integration. Um, and I'll be happy to explain that to you later. Um, it basically allows you to minimize instrument artifacts and get high signal noise ratios. Uh, the scanning design allows us to employ essentially a single, what we call, a, I guess, a pseudo -sync single detector system, and that allows us to characterize the system much easier than a two-dimensional detector array like uh, MODIS or MODIS. We have very tight threshold requirements for artifacts and very tight requirements for radiometry. Okay, um, the science deliverables that we're targeting with this mission are, you know, more advanced or more um, What's the word I'm looking for? It's not science this time. <laughs> Ambitious than some of the more uh, some of the I mean, heritage. The, the centers. point is, we've never done this. Before. We've never done this. Yeah. We've never done. No one's ever done this before. Let's and add the, that. It's yeah. not even an international goal. It's just and a I would, massive. Goal. And I would add that you know these are just what we're identifying now. There's more to do. Okay. Uh, but basic radiometry at the top. But then what I call the secondary variables. You know, phytoplankton pigment concentration. We're getting at absorption of the pigments. Phytoplankton biomass, taxonomic composition. Uh, particle size distributions, uh, photo, photo, uh, bio, photochemical uh, characteristics, photo biochemical characteristics, MAAs, likeability like proteins, um, DOC, primary production, and then what we call uh, tertiary variables, uh, carbon export, air CO2, air CO2 flux, and land ocean materials exchange. There are also threshold requirements that were set for the atmospheric components. I'm not going to go through this in detail, but for aerosols, getting aerosol optical depths with the ocean color sensor, and fraction of total visible optical depth contributed by the fine mode aerosols. And for clouds, things like cloud top pressure, cloud water path, optical thickness, and effective radius. For the polarimeter, this is my one slide polarimeter thing, so you get the sense of what we're looking at there. Um, the instrument was uh, or is envisioned as being a multi angle polarimeter two to three day coverage, so you have these measurements alongside of the ocean color data, and the spatial resolution at, at the worst, four kilometer at native. So the primary data products that we were targeting with this instrument are single scattering albedo, um, aerosol layer height, effective radius, which tells you something about aerosol size, um, a real refractive index, helps you tell, say something about aerosol composition, and the imaginary refractive index, which is important for ocean color, because it's the absorbing component. Um, applications, uh, to characterize the particle, particle aerosol particles, type and sizes, uh, reduce uncertainty in uh, climate forcing models with information on the aerosols. Also to improve ocean color uh, atmospheric correction. So this was kind of one of the basic reasons we wanted to merge these the polarimeter with an ocean color sensor. The idea is that if we can characterize the atmosphere better, the aerosols better, particularly the absorbing, we can do a better job with the atmospheric corrections. Okay? And then there's also scientific um, uh, interactions between the aerosols and the oceans. And there's other things we can do with this. And one idea I just put up here um, is, um, was exemplified by a paper by Hubert Lozé in 2008, um, where he used uh, polar data, polarization data, to characterize the types of particles that are in the ocean. So we can start thinking about how polarization might help us characterize um, the, the particles in, in the ocean as well. Paula? Okay. So, um that, should, that was a nice overview to give you some idea of what the advanced core mission is talking about, okay? This mission is definitely, for lack of a better name, an ocean color instrument that will do global ocean color clouds and aerosols. Um, a polarimeter is TBD. We should know by the fall whether this mission will include a polarimeter. As Mike said, this is a design to cost mission. It's a new paradigm for NASA, which means if you go to $805 million.1, we're done. And they're not kidding. Um, I know because I tested them on this. Um, this is focused on enhanced clouds and aerosol science. If we can fit it within the cost cap, we have a couple of ideas of how we might do that. We would, we would get the nod from the agency to proceed. 
Um, under discussion for potential ads, which we're trying to accommodate but may not be able to do so within the cost cap, is a, what we're calling sort of a coastal ocean color sensor, something to get at sort of the ground spatial distance of less than 100 meters of pixel size that's smaller than the global sort of notional one kilometer we usually go to. Um, that would, of course, allow us to look at um, a, a smaller scale coastal ocean science as well as some of the atmospheric properties. Um, obviously, I think we will wind up carrying some sort of other instrument to be determined by the Earth Venture Instrument Competition, the former ESSP line that NASA carries. Um, we don't know what that is or whether we'll carry one, but the spacecraft is likely to be scarred for an additional instrument. Um, and then direct broadcast, what that means is a, um, a quick turnaround series of data products, and the project is currently determining whether they have the capacity to, to add the antenna to afford it to actually do a direct broadcast. Um, our latency right now is sort of in the two to three hour time frame. Direct broadcast may allow you to do that a little bit faster, which has some targeted applications like um, not this mission, but you know, wildfires or if there's a tsunami. It's sort of a disaster focused kind of addition. So this is the part that's fun to talk about. So start thinking out of the box here. We're doing spectrometry from space. We're giving you that spectrum up at the top of five nanometer resolution. The question is, what are we going to do? With it? What can we do with this? Okay. We've identified some things we can do with this, but there's lots of room to think outside of that. And Paula talked about how long it takes to go from you know getting the okay to do a mission and actually getting the thing off the ground. One good side of that is that there's time to start developing approaches to actually delivering these products when the thing gets launched. So I think right now is a really exciting time to start thinking about how we can start developing algorithms to use that data. Okay. Just to throw out some thoughts on, on some of these targets, um, what can we do with atmosphere corrections to improve them? One of the ideas is that we can use some of the shorter UV wavelengths that are being measured to essentially anchor the atmospheric correction spectrum. With our traditional ocean color sensors, we're using near infrared, but the, the tail of that spectrum that you apply can wag all over the place. So if we could use the UV to anchor that, we could possibly do much better atmospheric correction, particularly in the blue wavelengths. Um, Polarimetry, what can we do with the polarimeter in order to improve our atmospheric corrections? Can we get the ozone, with, if we get the 315 nanometer capability, could we do the ozone better um, with that? And what might super, super sampling of the spectra do for us in this, in this regard? Phytoplankton community structure. And I'm not throwing out all the things to do, just throwing out ideas here. How do, how do we do this? How do we do phytoplankton community structure or composition? Um, marker pigments, can we do say, say something about marker pigments, something about the spectrum that tells us about marker pigments? Uh, one of the ideas on how you do this is with derivative analysis. There was some really nice work done by Ping Li a number of years back on doing second or fourth order derivative analyses of spectra to identify specific pigment markers. Or spectral matching algorithms. Do um, you guys know what that is? Okay, I call it the Home Depot version. Uh, it's kind of like making paint. You have base colors, and those colors you assign to a pigment. And then you say, okay, how much do I need of my different base colors to give me the total spectrum that I see. And you just change the concentration of those base colors until you match the spectrum, and that tells you the concentration of pigments. Um, Emmanuel Boss and, and some of his colleagues are doing some really nice demonstrations of that with hyperspectral field measurements uh, and pigment extractions. Dissolved carbon pools. So um, this one I was always, I've always been very excited about. The, if you look at the uncertainty and the CDOM retrieval for a standard inversion algorithm, um, compared to a wavelength ratio algorithm for chlorophyll. Those two algorithms give you a difference in ocean net production of 16 petagrams for a total of ocean production around 50. So it's a huge uncertainty in our NPP estimates. So can we use information in the UV to do a better job on CDOM? And the idea there is that in the UV, the pigment spectrum is decreasing in its absorption. CDOM is still going up exponentially. So we might have a lot more power to do that separation in the UV. Um, what about phytoplankton total par uh, carbon biomass? Um, can we do something or say something intelligent with this spectral information about this, the slope of the particle size distribution? How can we relate that then to variability in the composition of the particles and, and the biomass of these particles? Phytoplankton physiology, we're going to be obviously doing the fluorescence band pretty well. Does that tell us something about iron stress uh, and quantum yields? What if we did super spectral sampling around the fluorescence band. 
Could we learn something from that? Is there a dependence of that, of the nuances in that spectrum associated with specific, specific types of nutrient stress? Iron would be a, a high candidate for that. I can elaborate on that some more if you'd like. Um, phytoplankton absorption spectra. Can we characterize the actual total absorption spectra of the phytoplankton and then base our NPP models based on absorption rather than pigment? Photophysiology is based on the absorption of the cells, not on the concentration of some specific pigment like chlorophyll. And then if we take all these different parts, can we start improving our primary production estimates by integrating into these currently fairly simplistic models indicators of nutrient stress, community composition, biomass, and pigment spectra, improve CDOM? How do we start expanding the way we're doing NPP and size distributions or classes um, using this new information? And as I mentioned already, you know, there's a lot of work to be done here, and we have a window of time to start working on that. And then getting at these third level questions, export, you know, um, can carbon export and fate within the twilight zone be predicted from what we can see from space with PACE? That's really the, the bottom underlying question of the session we're going to hear right after this. Okay, so that brings us to money, everybody's favorite subject, and what's available for the science community to actually compete. Um, you will have these slides archived to go back to and look at, so in the interest of time, we'll be brief. Um, if you are an instrument person, meaning an in-situ instrument person, there'll be a number of opportunities to propose to actually help us do the in-situ, either vicarious calibration or data validation component of this. Um, you just heard about the huge host of in, um, excuse me, disciplinary and interdisciplinary science that this mission will likely be able to accomplish. We've got to validate a lot of those data. We don't even have a lot of institute instruments to do that. So there'll be open competitions um, between you know, this year and 2025 to actually bid some of that if you're an instrument maker. Um, next slide. And if you're interested in being part of the science team, Mike mentioned a lot of the formulation work is going on right now, and we are really looking for feedback on some of these ideas. So there are open competition pre-launch science teams. There's one active now. There's likely to be one in the Roses Omnibus coming in 2017 for the next team. And then at launch, there'll be another open competition. These are going to be three, four, five-year science teams to actually do some of the algorithm development and some of the other research in support of actually uh, helping us do some of these retrievals on orbit. And then post-launch competed science, obviously in the same vein that we've done the EOS program, um, competed science will be available and opportunities will be available to the science community. Yes. Okay. All right, so I just got two last slides I wanted to share. Um, and Paula kind of mentioned this at the very beginning. Uh, PACE didn't pop out of nowhere. This has actually been work in progress for 15 years, 16 years. Um, you can kind of trace the family tree or the genealogy of this mission back to a meeting in 2000, uh, the NASA Carbon uh, Program, a formulation meeting. That spurred on an idea of, which was based on this idea of integrating atmospheres and ocean, of a mission called Phylum, a physiology LIDAR mission. Um, and it was a LIDAR rather than a polarimeter. And then the polarimeter got added to this concept in 2005, 2007 in a mission called Oceans. Uh, which then evolved into something called GOSEP, and OCEANS was submitted to the, decadal, the earlier decadal survey. And out of that decadal survey called, came a mission called ACE. And there was a lot of work by the community that took place um, under the ACE mission, and then that led to a lot of the information that went into the idea of PACE and also the work that the PACE SDT put together in their large document. So there's been a very, very long history. Throughout this history of many different names, the basic concept has been the same, an advanced ocean color sensor and coupling that with atmospheric measurements. And when I was thinking about this basic philosophy, I've been involved in this from the very start, uh, up to my eyeballs. So I've been walking through this tree for a long time. And I was thinking about, well, what's the basic concept of this mission? And what popped into my mind, has, I mean, have any of you seen the movie Contact? <laughs> All right, so this is a scene from Contact that reminded me of the philosophy of pace. Okay, now the, un <laughs> are you, the underlying are, message are you is not that this is a suicide mission. <laughs> is that where this is going? <laughs> no, it was actually the last line that, that, I, that I liked about this. It's, um, you know, I, I gave you a bunch of reasons to do this mission, a lot of the cool science uh, that can be done with it. Um, but it's the stuff we haven't thought about that to me is the great motivator. 
Um, the heritage missions that we've flown, when they've been designed, the measurement bands that they were designed to measure were based upon the state of the science during the period of the design. And that, to me, is the difference here, is that this mission is not. This mission is designed for what we might do in the future, okay? Satellite data lasts a lot longer than the satellite, okay? So kind of the take-home message here is that PACE is a mission we can grow into, and we need to be thinking out of the box, and how are we going to use this information? We have more capability right now with this mission than what we know how to use, and that's really exciting. Oh, thanks. <laughs> So if you want more details on the mission, there's the website here. You can check that out. Yeah. How are we doing for time? Uh, How are we doing for time? We started a little late, but yeah, yeah we'll but we should. Move on to the, the export session, and then we can just take a bunch of questions during the discussion. Okay. okay. Sounds good. Okay. So I'm going to um, thank you for your, your attention on that. I'm going to introduce the um, next session. Um, so for those of you who are unfamiliar with exports, it's been a um, field campaign scoping study that's been um, underway um, in planning at NASA. First starting with a um, science team that was selected through, um, in 2012 to do actually do a draft, which is now a final science plan for exports. And then about a year ago, in fact, I think exactly a year ago, we competed a science definition team for the exports program. Um, and these volunteers have been working tirelessly since about October to bring you a draft potential implementation plan for the exports program. What you're going to hear this morning is an overview of the science associated with exports, which is not really under discussion anymore. We had put out the science plan for a number of public comment periods. We've discussed it ad nauseum. It's sort of uh, closed. But what we are discussing is the implementation options, which is a lot of what you will hear today. Um, I've heard a lot of feedback on exports, that it's a done deal, that the people involved, it's a done deal, that everything's sort of locked and loaded. I can assure you that is not true. If I came up with the best justification on the face of the planet, my bosses can still tell me to change it. The way that doesn't happen or the way you get what you want as an implementation is by providing that feedback to the team and to the agency that this is actually where the investment of the federal dollars at large should be going. Um, science in the government is a zero-sum game. There's not lots and lots of new money coming in, so you have to sort of weigh priorities um, appropriately. And I know this team has worked very hard to bring you a range of ideas of the science that could be accomplished and the implementation plans that could be accomplished with the exports program. I am incredibly grateful to them, and I'm going to hand it over to Rue, who's going to talk to you about the export science program. You're, you're doing the overview on science yeah. first, right?